Good afternoon. I think we can get started. My name is Nira Zakovich. Welcome, everybody. I'm the director of the Applied Ethics Center here at UMass Boston. And we are uh, very fortunate to have uh, Professor Ron Arkin of Georgia Tech today. Professor Arkin is the region's professor there uh, and the director of the Mobile Robot Laboratory. Uh, professor Arkin is one of those people who, even if I uh, begin to summarize uh, their career. It will take up all of his time for uh, speaking. So I will say instead that he is uh, one of the founders of the field of robotics as we know it, one of the founders of the field of robot ethics as we know it. Um, I was reading some of the leading, most interesting books uh, written about artificial uh, intelligence and some of the societal impact of artificial intelligence uh, in the last year, and invariably there's a moment, kind of like in uh, uh, <laughs> Plato's Apology, where the journalist goes around from person to person asking him what this means, and the person that they always ended up with in the um, uh, area of uh, robotics in the military was Professor Arkin, so I called him up, and I'm very happy that he said yes. So, Professor Arkin, Thank you, very much looking forward to this. I think I'm more notorious than anything else. Uh, it's a, 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 a different perspective uh, to share with you. And uh, it's great to be back in New England. Did you know I'm a UMass graduate? UMass Amherst, yeah. but uh, still uh, a UMass. Uh, so uh, I share your, uh, uh, your commonwealth, I guess, uh, in that particular respect. And today I won't be talking about the uh, um, robot military work directly uh, that I'm fairly well known for, but I'll be talking about other work that I've been doing uh, for the last 10 years or so um, in robot deception. Robot deception, why would anyone do that? Again, I said I'm notorious, right? So uh, uh, part of it is understanding the ethical frameworks uh, and the appropriateness of deception in uh, artificial intelligence and robotics in particular. And so why do we study this? Well, one thing, deception is rampant. It's everywhere. It's in nature. Animals use it all the time. It also helps us in artificial intelligence and even understanding each other because many theorists talk about something called the theory of mind, which means that I think I know what you're thinking. And to, uh, ba basically to have good human-robot interaction, you would like the robot to understand what you're thinking, if you could possibly do that. And as a byproduct of that, as Dan Dennett from Tufts, not far from here as well too, uh, has mentioned that deception is a byproduct of that because as soon as I understand what you're thinking, I can use that to do something that I might want you to do that you may not want to do. So that's an important aspect uh, of that. So this notion of social intelligence, the ability to also have people relate to robotic systems better may require the use of deception from time to time. We'll talk about that uh, as well. But as I mentioned, animals are rampant with this. This is a broken wing display in a plover bird, I think it's called. Uh, they use that to protect their nest. If they see a predator coming, uh, the mama bird fakes a broken wing and uh, the predator follows it. This is an interesting story of a chimp. Uh, the chimp is using tools, her son breaking nuts open with stones, and uh, she is grooming him. And there is a, if I scratch my back, you'll scratch my back uh, kind of strategy among primates, which extends up to hominids as well too, as probably you well know, uh, not just from the adage. Um, so she stops and expects the son to return the favor at this particular point, which as a good boy, uh, he certainly does, and is taking care of his mama. And unfortunately, mama may not be the best mama of all the mamas, because she <laughs> grasps the tools that she was using for her own particular purpose. Again, so this notion of being able to understand and plan in advance is an important aspect of things. Uh, we use it. It's common in the military. Oops, hold on a second. I can go back, or let me just start it over here. Football, adverse, whoa, that's different. I did speak too soon. This is my computer, not yours. Hold on a second. 
Okay. Well, in any case, while that's trying to resolve its spinning circle, um, if you, in adversarial sports, you'll see feints and you see ruses all the time. This is a flea flicker play, if you're familiar with that as well, too. And what do we do when we see deception under those circumstances? We cheer. We are excited about that. And I'm not sure what's going on with my laptop at this particular point in time. I've never seen it freeze like this. So bear with me for a second. Because I'm going to have to get to the next slide eventually. In the military, there's camouflage used as well. I've got a spinning wheel, so I don't think it's you. It's okay. I, let me just pull this and reinsert it and see if that works. No? This, is, this one's a first. I've not seen that happen before. Okay. I would. Yeah. Can't even get out and escape this, you see. Yeah, who ever saw that? That's very weird. Okay. And I can't even do the escape to get out of it. So let me do the. Classic reboot, which I'm not sure how to do that on this machine. I think it's this one. Bear with me. Get a cup of coffee. It's coffee break time. Okay. Yeah. This will just take a minute, hopefully. It's it's embedded. We're coming back now. Bring that up. I've never seen that one happen in the middle of a talk. Mm -hmm. The good news is these boot faster than uh, Windows machines. You shut down. I know I did. Uh, cancel. Okay. Okay. Let's bring that up. Let's see if this works. That was a PowerPoint problem. It was a Microsoft product, though. So. Okay. Okay, I'm going to skip past that one and then move on, uh, post that to other deception. This is for the benefit of the mark. We lie to each other sometimes to protect our feelings or to conceivably. Uh, <laughs> Conceivably assist. Uh, even, even products, you can outsmart little ones with a decoy button if they think they're going out the door. You can have them try and get out uh, as their mental development hasn't quite got to that particular stage. And uh, it's not always the best thing to do if you want people to like you, to be brutally honest all the time. Uh, so. If we want people to like robots, maybe there's an appropriate place for this as well. And many have understood that, again, this notion of social understanding, uh, Dennett's comment that when you get higher order intentionality, you may also get the opportunity for deception. Uh, and keep in mind, a fundamental test for intelligence, the Turing test, is based on deception. You can't be intelligent unless you're capable of deception, uh, according uh, to that particular test. So we believe that these social robots may be better off having the ability to deceive. This is an ethically debatable point, and we'll talk more about some of the ethics associated with that uh, near the end uh, of the talk. I don't know if you've seen the movie Interstellar. Have you happened to see that? Good movie. Had one of the strangest robots, really cool robot called TARS. It was this big X walking thing as well, too. But there was a segment in there where they're talking about uh, robot deception, I guess. Hey, Tars, what's your honesty parameter? 90%. 90%. Absolute honesty isn't always the most diplomatic, nor the safest form of communication with emotional beings. Okay. 90% of it is And so we're interested in understanding how much truth do you really want in your relationships? And can we adjust that? And we'll talk about how we can actually do that as well, too. This was actually after some of the work that we initially did in this particular space. There's others that have done work in robot deception. Some of the work was, uh, earliest work was by Floriano. Uh, this was groups of robots, and certain robots learned to mislead other robots away from energy sources uh, through evolutionary algorithms uh, and the like. 
A colleague at Yale, not too far from here, Brian Scassolati, uh, studied cheating robots. It would play uh, rock, paper, scissors with you. By the way, the Japanese rock, paper, scissors robots don't play. You'll never win. They are always faster than you are. They see your hand before you can actually know you're intentionally <laughs> going to put your fingers out. But in any case, this was not what uh, Brian did. He played rock, paper, scissors. And in some cases, you know, rock, rock, paper, scissors. Sometimes the robot occasionally would do this. <laughs> OK. And then he measured what people thought of the robot afterwards. And they invariably seemed to think that the robot that cheated was smarter than all the other robots. And they paid more attention to the robot after it cheated on them. So that's an interesting observation, again, for engagement and the like as well, too. Maybe that would conceivably be useful. It's been used for referees and physical therapy and encouraging people uh, when they may not really be doing well, but you're telling them they're doing well. Uh, one of the classic things I could say to you is, this is the best audience I've ever had. But you could also say to me, that was a great talk afterwards as well, too. So there's all these options uh, that we can do, and we might feel better uh, for it. The military obviously knows and has known for thousands of years the value of deception. Warfare and uh, in, in, uh, the art of war by Sun Tzu stated that all warfare is based on deception. Uh, Machiavelli talks about deceit being detestable and all other things, which is strange for Machiavelli. But yet in the conduct of war, it is laudable and honorable. Think about it, going back to the Trojan horse and uh, even in the Bible, all the ambushes and things that are done. And there is a field manual for the US Army as well too. It's been around for a long time for battlefield deception as well too, how to put it to work. And it's considered acceptable in most cases, but not all cases. Things like ruses uh, where you feign that you are shot or injured and you're not, those are war crimes if you do that. So, there is a limit that international society has put on in terms of deception. But troop maneuvers and other things, that's OK. So I'm going to quickly overview. I'm not going to go into great technical depth in this. We have all the technical papers that you want on our website uh, for these aspects. If you have any trouble locating them, I'll be glad to uh, uh, forward you the links. Uh, but first, we'll start off with interdependence theory, a model of human psychology. Look then at animal models uh, using the handicap and dishonesty principles uh, developed in one case by an Israeli, uh, Zahavi, a famous uh, biologist. Uh, squirrel cash hoarding, all your squirrels that are out there. The eastern gray squirrels are a little smarter than you might think uh, in terms of some of their behaviors. Uh, and then deception, as he said, for the benefit of the mark. And then I'll just briefly mention this work in team misdirection using shills and other things that we've just begun work on a, under a new uh, National Science Foundation grant, uh, which is continuing this line uh, of research. So this is a long longitudinal review of the work that we've done in this particular space. So what is really deception? At least in the context of the first work that we're doing, this is, this is it. It talks about generating a false communication, transmitting that information, and I'll be referring to the receiver of that information as the mark. Okay, that's the person that's being deceived. That's the mark in this particular case. The mark interprets it, and then it influences the action of the mark. And in this early work, we talk about deception as being a false communication that tends to benefit the communicator. Okay, I'm telling this to you because it has value to me. Okay, if it takes away from you, too bad. Okay, that's a secondary uh, effect, but it's giving me something. And I'm lying to you because I need or want something in this particular case. So what we need from a robotic perspective is you have to understand the situation that you're in. You have to have situational context. And you can't lie all the time as well, too. You have to understand basically two things. You have to understand when to deceive, because if you try and deceive all the time or at the wrong time, it's just not going to work. And the other thing is how to deceive when it's the time. Okay? And in this early work, in interdependence theory, we're looking at a multidimensional space. We're just looking at two uh, dimensions of interdependence, which deal with conflict and dependence. And then the mark has to be understood by the deceiver. This is building up that partner model, as we call it, a partial, partial theory of mind. And then produce an action which misleads the 
other agent, your mark in this particular case. Now, again for the when question, this is the dimensions of the interdependent space that we're looking at. One is there must be conflict. There must be conflict. If I get an advantage, it's a disadvantage to you. If it benefits both of us, why should I deceive you? Because we're going the same path. So if I have something, or if you have something and I want it, but you want it too, there's a conflict that's inherent in that. So when we want to deceive is when there is a conflict. And then there must be some dependence associated with that, up at the top part of that, in the sense that when I get something, what you're giving me is a value to me in this particular context. So we have to be up in this particular area. And if you mark that out as 10%, that's TARS set the parameter for 90% uh, uh, in this particular case, as to when we're going to deceive you uh, under these particular circumstances. And we have the math and the, uh, all the algorithms and journal articles and everything else available for both the situational assessment and the other kinds of things that enable us to map into this particular space in a particular situation. I'll show an illustration of some of this in a little bit. And then we have the how. And part of understanding the how is my understanding what affects you. Because if I don't understand your sensory space or the kinds of information that you will process, it doesn't do me any good. We use a Bayesian belief system to be able to accomplish this, and we try and give the information to the mark that will change their action. And if you look at it from a game theoretic perspective, for example, suppose you're thinking of playing dead. Forget the war crimes, okay? Uh, you're thinking of playing dead. I mean, you're not gonna use the ruse to shoot somebody, but you're just acting like you're dead in a kidnapping or something like that. Um, that may have a negative effect. But if I can make you think that playing dead somehow will achieve you great benefit, you'll be happy, you'll live long if you do that. If I can induce that in you, maybe by pretending I'm going away or something along like that, then it will be a decided advantage in this particular case. So we're trying to change the actual matrix, outcome matrix, to the induced matrix. Okay? We're trying to change the beliefs of the outcomes of particular actions using this particular strategy. And the issue is, well, how do I do that? What do I tell you? And we do it in a variety of different ways. A couple of things we should note is here that one thing is uh, if the mark has a lot of sensors, and this kind of surprised the Navy when we first thought about it, if you have a lot of sensors, you're worse off than if you have no sensors. Well, that seems counterintuitive, right? I mean, you think there's more. But there's more opportunity to deceive if you have more sensors. If you're a stone, if you can't sense anything, I can't deceive you, right? If you've got no sensors. So the more sensors you have, the more pathways to deception uh, that there are. And also, these are probes and understanding the mark itself. The better I understand what your action space is, your outcome matrix is, the better off I am in this particular case in trying to change it to my advantage. Okay, so these are a number of queries that we put in uh, to that. Now, we'll illustrate this in a robot experiment. A lot of the stuff we did in simulation. This is one uh, that we played hide and seek. There's a lot of robots that played hide and seek, but we played hide and seek with deception. Remember Star Wars 4, which is Star Wars 1. Remember that? In the very beginning of the very first Star Wars, uh, where is it, uh, R2-D2 is kind of hiding from the stormtroopers as they come in, uh, and then the stormtroopers go by and he's able to get out the map of everything to uh, uh, the princess or who, whoever it may be. Uh, well, he just hid. What if you create false paths, right? Native Americans have known about this as well too. If you're going down a path and you create a path somewhere else, you're likely to have a better success rate of being able to deceive that particular agent. And that's what we did here. This is a uh, kind of example of a simplistic version of fooling a robot in this particular case using stood up markers to illustrate that the robot was going down a path which it really hadn't. We don't know which markers it's going to uh, do in the first place. Uh, this is the, uh, the deceiver trying to hide. In this particular case, it's fading, hiding to the left. Uh, and uh, it chooses to hide uh, in the middle location. 
These are not very bright robots, but it illustrates the point uh, from a uh, uh, theoretical uh, point of view. And then this one, uh, equally stupid, in this case, recognizes, oh, there's a path down over there. This is good for one-shot deception, by the way. You will not continuously be able to do that. Heads off uh, in the other direction, which creates the opportunity to escape, which is a very useful uh, opportunity. As I said, we don't always know, and it may knock down a couple of markers in this case, uh, but uh, it will vary. Uh, so there's a, a notion of unpredictability associated with it. So that's basically what we did there. And the claims that we made were the following. We said that based on where that situation is in the interdependent space, we can determine whether deception should be undertaken. If there's no conflict, uh, if there's no dependence, why bother? It doesn't have any value in that particular case. And we showed that the more you know about how the mark is going to act, the better off you are in terms of uh, success rates and determining which false communication that you should use. So what did we specifically say in this journal article that we published in the International Journal of Social Robotics? We said, the results do not represent the final word on robots and deception. We said, the results are a preliminary indication that the techniques and algorithms described in this paper can be fruitfully used to produce deceptive behavior in a robot. We said, much more psychologically valid evidence will be required to strongly confirm this hypothesis. That seems responsible, doesn't it? Does that seem tempered? Doesn't that seem like a reasonable thing to say? This is what others said as well, too, okay? Researchers at the Georgia Institute, <laughs> terrible, terrible mistake. They've taught robots how to deceive. But when machines rise up against humans and the robot apocalypse arrives, we're all going to be wishing that Ronald Arkin and Alan Wagner had kept their ideas to themselves. <laughs> oh, it gets worse, okay? Uh, Ronald Arkin and Alan Wagner, two names likely doomed to live in infamy. In a stunning display of hubris, the men, researchers from Georgia Tech, published a paper teaching two robots how to play hide and seek. I like this one too. Robots capable of deceiving humans built by crazed boffins. Okay. <laughs> all sorts of things as well too. But the best of all is what follows. And all along we've assumed, we've assumed folks, that robots were innocent servants until now. Scientists at Georgia Tech have taught robots how to lie. Presumably to tell whoever gave them the research grant their money was well spent. <laughs> These Georgia Techs are the same brainiacs that last year built a robot that plays jazz. Now they've created a robot that can lie and say it likes jazz. <laughs> I love Colbert. I still watch him. I still watch him. But I was a little nervous the next morning after that came out. Was, what my funding agent going to say? <laughs> So I eventually called him up and I said, had you seen it? He said, yes. And I said, what do you think? Should we keep doing this? And he said, I want more. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. They want more deception as well too uh, uh, along those lines. So there are interesting questions associated uh, with that. There were, the opposite thing also occurred as well too. The Deceitful Robot was considered one of the 50 best inventions of 2010 by Time Magazine. And I don't even think it was an invention. Uh, so that kind of surprised me as well, too. So some people really liked it. Some people thought it's the end of the world. Uh, it's really bizarre, uh, the reaction that people had to this particular uh, form of uh, research. New Scientist is probably the one that I think kind of got it right, from my point of view. It says, exploring the robot theory of mind in these ways could even tell us something about ourselves. Any computational code that supports the external behavioral properties of theory of mind and deception can help us understand what's going on in the human mind. I like that one. <laughs> I, like the, I like the award, too, the 2010 thing. That was nice recognition. And I like Colbert, for that matter, as well. So, but it's interesting. It's interesting seeing the reaction of people to deception. Is it the end of the world? Well, we'll talk more about it as well, too. The next phase we went into were the squirrels. Remember I was talking about squirrels earlier? Eastern gray squirrels. They, uh, they're hoarders. And what they do is, for the winter, they go out and get nuts, as you probably know, and then they bury them in caches. They dig little holes and put them in the ground, and they'll dig a, a hole over here. That's important for survival, right? I mean, if they don't have those, they're going to die uh, in the winter, run out of food. So what occurs uh, with these? Well, it's been observed, uh, at least in one study, 
that the eastern gray squirrel uh, uses deception to protect its nuts. And that's, I don't mean it to sound quite like that, but that's what it does. Um, it basically, there is a patrolling strategy that squirrels use. They, I, I'm doing my best to act like a squirrel here, so forgive me. Uh, they go over here, are my nuts okay? Okay, I'll go over here. Are my nuts okay? Whew. Okay, so I'm, I'm good for now. And they patrol back and forth to protect their caches. But then, a conspecific, another squirrel, sees them, okay? They know they're patrolling for their nuts. So what does this guy do, the one that's got the caches? Well, he goes over here, and he says, are my nuts okay? There aren't any nuts over here. <laughs> are my nuts okay? <laughs> and so that tends to delay pilferage. Okay, pilferage, which is the protecting and uh, storing of your uh, resources over time. So a false signal is done, and this is evolutionary, not using theory of mind or anything like that, but uh, uh, nonetheless, it is a deceptive strategy or behavior that these animals exhibit. And we implemented that on the robots as well, too. Um, we implemented it first in simulation, uh, where they go out and they do this, and then the competitor comes out. And we studied quantitatively, does it really effectively reduce the rates of pilferage uh, in uh, uh, these uh, circumstances. So it goes back and forth and patrols, and this is pretty boring, so uh, I got lots of boring videos to show you if you like. But it basically, it, then it starts to follow this guy and pays attention to that, and so on. And then we put this, of course, on robots. Uh, we like to show our simulations are grounded on real-world scenarios using a couple of pioneer robots. Initially, we had a human operating uh, the uh, uh, conspecific, and the other one we made it uh, autonomous as well too. Uh, but the whole notion was again to try and mislead the other robot into wasting its time looking in places that it shouldn't be. Which doesn't absolutely prevent pilferage, but it delays pilferage. And that may be enough. Think in war, what happens? One of the most important things is a delaying tactic. And if you can protect your resources for a little bit longer than you would do otherwise, that can make the entire difference in terms of mustering other resources uh, to uh, back you up or to protect those resources from another source. Again, you can see the difference uh, in the uh, convergence rates in this particular case that deception, pilferage was delayed. And what is interesting also is the difference in the receptivity to this work. Squirrels, birds, teach robots to deceive. Georgia Tech robots learn deceptive behaviors from squirrels. Animal bluffs inspire a new breed of deceptive robots. Why did everybody like that? Oh, look at that. <laughs> look at that. Isn't that remarkable, the difference in response? Uh, it's still deception, right? Still the same sort of thing. But one's the end of the world and one's cute, OK? I, you know, I was equally surprised. There must be a sociological study that has to be done on these kinds of things as well, too. But uh, it was just uh, a little bit different, uh, to say the least. Well, then we moved on. Looking at more group behavior. Now, mobbing behavior in birds is an unusual, a different kind of thing. When a predator attacks a flock of birds, in this case, uh, Arabian babblers uh, in the uh, Negev Desert, uh, as studied by uh, Amot Zahavi, uh, a famous biologist. Um, they have two choices. Oops, let's see if I can get that one. One, you can fly away, or you can stand your ground, okay? And there's safety in numbers in this case, because what these birds typically will do is try and harass the predator, okay? And this harassing can sometimes cause the predator to fly away. Okay, you still got your ground, you don't have to do it. This is mobbing behavior in this case. It's done over snakes, it's done over many different types of, animal, of birds and the like. So this mobbing behavior is an important aspect. Uh, and so that's not deception. Actually, Zahavi would argue in his uh, handicap principle that any signal that is sufficiently costly, what's more costly than losing your life, must be true in biology. Okay, it must be true. And he would still argue that to this day. I think he's still alive, but it uh, must be true to this day. Another fellow named Greffin talked about the dishonesty principle, which says that these systems can still be stable if a little bit of dishonesty is there. So if you have one bird there, those other birds are saying, I'm really fit. 
You're not going to get me. I'm going to harass you and too bad for you. But what if there's one that's not quite so fit? Okay, or two, or three. Are you going to bluff in this particular case? Are, will it pay off if you bluff, if your life is at stake under these circumstances? So feigning strength, this is a common military tactic uh, as well where you will parade or demonstrate, and there may not actually be any uh, strength behind that particular demonstration as well, too. It could be really costly. It could cost you your life. But nonetheless, uh, this is what's involved. And let's talk about the handicap principle uh, a little bit more. This states, as I mentioned before, that any agent that is sufficiently fit uh, can have a signal that demonstrates it. And that signal is really costly. Beautiful signal, right? Powerful signal. That's heavy, okay? That delays it from getting away from predators. But gosh, doesn't it show that, that bird is fit? Uh, doesn't it say, uh, look at me, I'm really fit, okay? You know, if I'm not a muscle person, but I could do the same sort of thing in that particular case. But human beings do it slightly differently. This is how human beings do it, okay? A man walks into a bar. What's this guy, first of all, what's this guy looking for? He's also looking for peahens or scarce resources, okay? There's only so many peahens to go around. But in this case, a man walks into a bar wearing a Rolex. Why is he wearing a Rolex? To tell the time better? No, he's not wearing a Rolex to tell the time better. It's saying, I got so much money, I don't know what to do with it, okay? I'm, I'm sure I have a $30,000 watch. And what is that attempting to do? Show how fit you are and maybe attract scarce resources, okay? But now, according to Greffin, remember the dishonesty principle? A man walks into a bar, and forgive me if I'm saying men, but uh, uh, this is the standard joke line. A man walks into a bar wearing a fake Rolex. Does that work? Maybe, okay? How many fake Rolexes will the system tolerate before it breaks down? And then, all men walk into a bar and they're all wearing Rolexes and fake Rolexes. The signal has no value whatsoever under those circumstances. In essence, what we're trying to study is, here is how many fake Rolexes uh, can it work uh, in a bar and still have the net effect of being able to attract scarce resources. But we're not doing it in that same way because we're not attracting scarce mates for robots uh, in this particular case, but rather, um, we are looking at the uh, situation I described earlier uh, with mobbing behavior. How many robots does it take to drive away and harass a uh, potential predator uh, in this case? And how fit do those agents have to be? You can demonstrate. Imagine one of those robots looks really fit, but it's only got 30 seconds left of power, okay? So it might look really strong, but <laughs> just wait 30 seconds and it's over. Okay, so, and this is important from a military point of view as well too. This is the notion of demonstrating things. What happens if the uh, energy runs out? And so the real question we try to understand again is, how many robots does it take to successfully drive away a, or harass a potential predator in this case? Um, and how many unfit robots can contribute to that and under, one circ under what circumstance? And what we found is the border conditions are what's best, not surprisingly. Deception works when you've got almost enough to drive away uh, the predator, and maybe one more will put you over the top. In that case, it's worth the risk because you're likely to be successful under those circumstances. And uh, small mob sizes, though, uh, you have low mortality uh, in this particular case as well, too. Um, so adding deception can result in reduced mortality under those circumstances. Again, all of this is in the journal articles and the explanation of the details in the graph are present there as well too, but time won't allow me to go into it much more, but I'll be glad to answer questions uh, if you like. Okay, next step. Most recent PhD student uh, finished her work uh, in this particular area. This is, I'm gonna lie for you for your own good, okay? This is good for you. I'm gonna not tell you the truth because you'll be better off by not knowing uh, the truth. And we used a model, in this case, derived from criminological law, okay? Uh, so uh, criminology provides a basis uh, for, for this. When is this used? It's used to, uh, in some cases, when there's uh, a lot of people injured, 
God forbid, remember the Boston Marathon? Again, that's happening this, this coming weekend, uh, a long time ago, a lot of people injured. Sometimes someone will come up and say, you'll be okay. And you may not be okay. Part of it is to try and reduce the likelihood of shock. There was a great scene in a terrible movie. Uh, I always find terrible movies to be a great inspiration uh, to me. It's called Horrible Bosses 2. I hope you, <laughs> if you saw it, I hope you don't remember it. <laughs> But there was one scene in that where, um, it might be a spoiler, but too bad, it's, it might prevent you from watching it. Uh, there's uh, three guys. One of the guys is shot near the end of the movie. And one guy comes up to him and says, oh my God, you're gonna die. And then the other guy comes up and says, don't tell him that, you'll be fine, it's okay. <laughs> the other guy says, no, you're gonna die, look at you, there's blood everywhere, okay? One's telling the truth. Uh, Actually, he does end up living in the like as well, too. But the real question is, what's the right thing to do? Kant would have difficulty with lying under any sets of circumstances, but uh, independent uh, of that, it can serve a useful role in managing shock. Also, uh, establishing uh, strong bonds and a variety of different things as well, too, even in teaching as well, too. You know, you're really doing great. You're encouraging them. Maybe falsely, you might not be doing as good as you think, as, as you really are, but we want to keep you engaged under those sorts of things. These are things that we tell people to help them improve their performance conceivably as well. So in criminology, we use not just what and when, but we add, added a motive to this as well too. So there's not only when are you going to do it and how are you going to do it, but why are you going to do it, okay? So we added this particular context uh, to do it as well, too. And we did this with uh, elderly folks, but there's, I should mention as well, too, that there are two different types of deception we acknowledge now. One is deliberately giving a false communication, and the other is deliberately withholding a truthful communication as well, too. So this is almost like the Catholic Church of sins by commission or omission. This is deception by commission. Uh, or omission. You can hide information or you can give out information as well too. And so what we did here, uh, uh, using work that I started working with Sony on and they're uh, humanoid, but this is a more recent, two different versions of robots. This one has facial expressions and this is a now robot as well. Uh, it uses gestures, not words. It uses facial expressions and it can also vary its proximity to you as well too. All of which are cues in a variety of different ways. We integrate that together and we can have a set of actions uh, which are in some cases true. In other words, the robot angry, we can make it look angry or we can show fear. We can have it sad or disgusted uh, or when it, should, when it was happy, but we can change it into sad or disgusted in some cases. We can issue these false signals. False signals do not always have to be language is what I'm trying to convey here uh, as well. And it's important, you can couple it with language, but this notion of kinesics or body language is an important way in which we convey communication to each other, right? We talk to each other through emblems and postures in a variety of different ways. That's natural, it's an inherent part of our communication. It's called nonverbal communication. We also dealt with the motive by looking at previous results using case-based reasoning, um, different strategies, symbolic strategies of recognize a situation that occurred in the past and pulling up the way in which this successful operation was useful and then modifying it to fit the particular context uh, in which uh, we're in. So again, the gory details are in her dissertation uh, for this. The task that we looked at was a pill sorting task. And this is an important task. We were doing some work uh, uh, for the National Science Foundation in managing Parkinson's patients. Uh, and one of the things that's crucially important is being able to teach pill sorting. If you get it wrong, you can die, okay? And it's hard for people that have uh, mental and or physical challenges to get it right, okay? And so uh, we made a dual type of task as well too, but we weren't using the Parkinson's patients in this case, but we were using people over uh, 60, I believe it was, and we were giving them a dual task to load their cognition uh, on top of the normal uh, aspects and evaluate how well they would do. So we pushed them to make sure that they get these complex pill sorting tasks for the next two weeks or whatever it is correct. Uh, and uh, we found that occasionally the robot would lie to them. If it started to appear that they were getting frustrated with how things were going, 
then the robot might say, you got that right. But it wasn't right. It wasn't right. The point was, what is the gain if you keep them engaged as opposed to getting so frustrated that they walk away? Okay? This is, this is a question for a teacher as well, too, in, in many cases. Is it, do you always want to tell them the absolute truth? Wrong, right, wrong, right. How do you manage those kinds of situations? So uh, using uh, the performance evaluation strategies, the most important thing that we saw is that we were able to uh, reduce the frustration levels uh, in uh, the uh, people by occasionally lying to them without having an impact on their overall end game task performance. Okay? So truth and training, maybe not all the time. Have to be careful with that, but that's the conclusion in this particular task uh, that we did. And I'd be cautious in generalizing beyond it. But it shows again that sometimes keeping people engaged as opposed to, I'm failing this task, I'm not going to do it anymore, might be a better strategy uh, in this case. All right. And the last project I have, uh, the current one, as I mentioned, uh, is dealing with robot teams. We've been inspired by a lot of different things. Uh, we're looking at shills and con artists right now, but there's many other aspects that we can use, um, time permitting, which I doubt we'll be able to get to all uh, of these. But a shill is a confederate with a con artist. You're all familiar with the shell game. They still play it in the Boston Common, uh, where, uh, or uh, uh, what's, the, what's the square? The big, uh, I can't remember where the uh, old Faneuil Hall, Faneuil Hall, that, there's this name for that area, right, as well, Quincy too. Market. Yeah. A Quincy Market, yeah. I'm sure you might see somebody out there playing the old shell game as well, too. And you can play the shell game, a lot of people will watch, but then someone will step up and they'll play with the guy and they'll win. But that person was a shill, okay? He let them win in that particular case because it encourages others to come in and get engaged as well, too. So this notion of shills and confederates, whether it's as an elaborate a hoax as you saw in the sting, or whether it's just uh, a simple uh, individual uh, stepping into it, can affect entire groups of agents. And in particular, we're looking at two ways to move crowds, okay? Uh, Pied Piper is a good example as well, too, or a bad example, <laughs> depending on what you want your kids to do. Uh, rats are okay uh, in this particular case, but how can we get all these people to follow that individual? Well, we don't have a pipe. Robots can't play these pipes and magically enchant them uh, to follow them. But suppose, if you've ever been in a crowd and you've seen one person walk in that direction, but then suppose you see five people start walking in that direction. Aren't you possibly more predisposed to move in that direction along with them? What's going on over there? You don't have any more information other than that redirection. So what we're studying is planting shills alongside with that leader to move into a, a, a different space. And so this shows a couple of uh, examples without shills and with shills. Um, and we don't have the quantitative data on this right now. We're just finishing up a paper on the next strategy uh, that I'll talk about to be able to relocate these agents uh, from one location to the other. In this case, just the leader, but in this case with the shills, it works more uh, successfully. So the real question from us is not whether the shills can assist in doing that. We know that, but what's a minimal number of shills to be able to accomplish the task? How can we quantify that so that we're not wasting resources uh, in the deployment of these sorts of things? So this is a form of misdirection. The other one we use is a push approach. There have been robotic sheepdogs, I don't know if you're familiar with those, which go behind flocks of sheep and push them from one location to the other. They can actually do it. I should have probably put a video of that up here. Um, what happens if you plant a shill in there as well too to assist in the moving of those so you don't get the bifurcations and the splitting of the flocks uh, as they move? The other example I should have mentioned uh, is Instead of having an aggressive agent behind them, um, what if you, uh, you're familiar with the notion of a Judas horse or a Judas goat? These are things that are used in slaughterhouses uh, that are used to follow, animals follow them to the slaughterhouse and then they're turned back. Uh, the Judas one has survived and used again over and over again. Uh, I suspect similar things were probably in the Holocaust as well too uh, to get people into the showers. But in slaughterhouses, this is a routine thing. How do you move these masses from one location uh, to the other? And uh, that was the previous one. This one is the use of confederates in this particular case to keep people moving. So here we are, okay? 
That's a lot of deception, isn't it? That's a whole lot of deception in a whole lot of different ways. And I would say we barely scratch the surface of the opportunities that deception affords. Should we be doing it? Is it okay for humans to lie? Well, in some philosophical frameworks, absolutely not. Kantianism would argue that's inappropriate. Ethics 101, right? I mean, that's the first thing you show, that language and communication breaks down if you're allowed to lie. But what about in robots? So there's two main theories we look at here. These are not all of them. I know virtue ethics is an interesting one as well, too. It's a little harder to analyze in this context. But here again, any deceptive behaviors or lies are morally incorrect, human or robot. Now, the utilitarian argues increasing benefits or happiness among all the stakeholders. So let's go back to TARS. They seem to make those people happier in that particular case and still not have mission erosion. Everybody seemed better off with that. The outcomes are better, for example, in triaging uh, patients with a potential shock. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it is acceptable. What's a robot to do? What's a roboticist to do? What should we do? Okay, we can imagine this being used for nefarious purposes, certainly, right? I mean, it's not, even if we want to say it should be used for beneficial, how can we ensure that it's used uh, appropriately? Is there a fundamental right that humans should not be lied to, to each other, let alone by a piece of machinery? Okay, is there? And Kant would say, absolutely not. But as I mentioned, utilitarianism, there are certain cases. There's, there's bus stops in Germany outside of uh, folks that have uh, well, Alzheimer's. See, I'm probably getting there if I can't remember what Alzheimer's is. Um, so you can, uh, Alzheimer's uh, places, they, people tend to wander off if you're familiar with that. So what they did was they put bus stop signs outside there. And so the people stand there and wait for the bus, but there's no bus, there is no bus, okay? But that's for their benefit in this particular case. So. Uh, there's all kinds of strategies which could be viewed as potentially good. But even if that's okay for human beings to do, should we have machinery that does it? Now, technically, there are no ethical guidelines in force. There is something that just came out, though. Uh, it's called the IEEE, I'll share it with you later, uh, Ethically Aligned Design Document. It's uh, uh, a five-year initiative involving hundreds of researchers, theologians, sociologists, philosophers, and others as well, too, trying to address most of the ethical problems in this space. Some of them have been documented. And uh, uh, they start to provide some guidelines. I was in, particularly involved in the affective computing, which also incorporated the deception side of guidelines and the like as well, too. But they're not in force. These are, not, these are barely even recommendations uh, at this particular point. But here's the thing. Okay? If you ask a watch, what time is it? It knows you are always five minutes late to a meeting. Okay? You're always five, actually, I pointed the people in the back of the room. You're always five minutes late. You're, you're always five minutes late. So your watch will always tell you five minutes in advance. Okay? What time is it? It's really one o'clock. It's 105. Okay? So you'll get to your meeting on time if it knows there. Should it do that? Is that a good thing? It can adjust the truth to help you, okay? Is that what you want? And of course, these discussions have to be ongoing. It's certainly not for a roboticist to decide, nor a group of a particular individuals, even philosophers, uh, uh, to, to that. But collectively, we have to come to decisions as to how this technology should be used. And if you'd like some further information, there's a whole bunch of different sources ranging from our publications, as I mentioned before. Uh, this is the Global Initiative. Uh, don't, if you want to take a picture of it, you can. It's probably the best way to get it. Or send me an email, and I could send you the document uh, that's associated with that uh, as well. Um, I've been involved with the Social Implications of Technology Society, and I'm finishing up two sections of my favorite course, uh, Robots and Society, where we talk about these things. And I learned far more uh, from my students in this. We're having debates on lying robots uh, next week uh, as well, too. So I hope to get their particular perspective. Uh, it's certainly generational from time to time. And with that, I will thank you uh, for your time and be glad to take any questions you might have. Thank you for such an interesting talk. Um, I have a question. Do you see this as a pathway 
to teach robots to mimic human-like behaviors. And I'm not talking about just like using uh, signals, but mm -hmm. actually being able to emulate somewhat, recognize human uh, emotions and be able to, in a way, transmit uh, uh, a genuine response to those emotions. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I've always been intrigued about that. Yeah. I, I, as I mentioned, I think, I, or maybe I didn't, uh, I've worked extensively uh, with robot emotions, and I always put them in quotes because they're only emotions to you. The robot doesn't experience anything. And it's surprisingly easy uh, to be able to engage people uh, because we anthropomorphize almost everything. Uh, we can cry at a bunch of dots in a movie theater or stick figures or, or, or what have you. So this ability to generate uh, emulate, if you will, and emulate is the right word, uh, emotional response uh, in order to manipulate human emotions is very possible and very real. This is my second biggest concern behind war uh, robots right now because uh, we can develop intimate relationships with these artifacts. They have a physical extent, they're embodied within the world, and they can be, I mean, my wife's on my case more often than not for just paying attention to my cell phone instead of her uh, from time to time. And if you start looking at the movies and all the other things as well too, the potential for deeper engagements with artifacts uh, becomes uh, very, very real. So yes, uh, people are looking into that, even the genuine, uh, I would say the genuine uh, thing is easier than the deceptive one because that requires this notion again, often of a theory of mind. To be able to deceive you, I have to have really higher order intentionality as Dennett referred to it to be able to get you to feel, I just have to act, uh, as a good actor would as well too. I don't even necessarily even have to feel that. I don't even necessarily have to know what you're thinking. I just have to know what my actions do in bringing out your particular responses in that particular case. So hopefully that answers what you were uh, trying to say. Uh, I have uh, two questions. One is I'd just like you to talk a little bit more about um, the amount of deception that can be used in iterative games, mm -hmm. right? So obviously, if you deceive 100% of the time, deception doesn't work very quickly, yeah. right? So just uh, general, is there, or did you find generalizations across these different forms of deception mm -hmm. that you've laid out uh, with respect to that sort of optimal amount of deception? Yeah. So that's just a, can you talk more about that? I'm, I'm a little bit, I guess I want to know a little bit more about the theory of mind stuff. That's okay. really interesting to me because yeah. of course the mark has to be able to, or has to, well, that's the question. Do the, does the mark have to be able to interpret the communication? Mm -hmm. I think that was your step four or something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that notion of interpretation, I'm, I'm interested in how deep or how thick of an interpretation you take that to be, or is that just simple signal processing? Um, and it brought up, especially with respect to the squirrel, I think you said off the, uh, that this wasn't a theory of mind behavior yeah. with the squirrel mobbing, it was uh, mm -hmm. instinctive. Mm -hmm. What's the threshold there between the entity, right? I mean, it, there's a whole mess of stuff about communication, about uh, signals, about meaning, yeah. and about interpretation yeah. that's also connected to the ability to ascribe mental states mm -hmm. or sure. particular kinds of behaviors to the elder. Okay, so yes, there's lots of stuff there. You're really talking about the whole field of ethology to some extent as well, too. Uh, and uh, if you look at animal behaviors from a behaviorist perspective as well, too, there is no higher level understanding of anything that's going on. These are basically responses to particular conditions that are put in front of them, and they respond in a so-called optimal way uh, for that environment, and they will evolve to get better, as particularly as their ecological niche changes uh, over time. Um, but speaking about the kinds of theories of mind uh, that uh, you're interested in, we did it two ways. One, these are what do we call partner modeling. We're kind of reluctant to call it theory of mind uh, because a theory of mind is grandiose, right? I mean, that's, that's big. So we call them generally partial theory of mind or partner modeling. In the first case, uh, in interdependence theory, we were talking about that in the context of uh, modeling the game theoretic matrix of the outcomes of actions in each agent, okay? So it's not modeling their full understanding. I understand what you're going to do if you do this, uh, if I do this, and uh, for a series of particular actions. So I'm quantifying as best as I can the outcomes of particular things that I do based on what I think you will do as a result of that. Now it gets more complex. I have another student right now who's working in a different scenario on a different project uh, dealing with uh, power dyads and how robots can intervene when 
people are treating other people poorly when there's a uh, power asymmetry, such as in uh, uh, advisor, student, uh, parent, child, uh, and, or patient, doctor, which is the one in particular that we're looking at. The partial theory of mind that we're looking at is using some of the moral emotions and understanding how is it that you're feeling? And we've learned over time, as I mentioned, we have patents and other things as this, to be able to model those effectively. We usually model them for the agent itself. So is the agent happy? Uh, okay, I have a variable that's at this point and the unhappiness is set here. So yeah, I'm happy. So I can make the robot act happy. Uh, is it happy? No, it's not, but I can make it act happy. That's the thing as well too, which is more the behaviorist kind of uh, view. Um, but now we're trying to model, are you happy? Uh, so I, because that'll affect what I do in this particular case. And we're trying to do it in the context of other deception now. But if I understand that you're happy, what's, or unhappy, what's the appropriate response? Somehow the robot has to maintain an understanding of your emotional state in that case. So we're trying to use physiological signals and other things as well to, to set those similar variables within the robot so that it only doesn't express what it's feeling, but it, it expresses what it is that it thinks would help you feel better, worse, or, or whatever the case may happen to be. And then the first question, again, quickly. Just about the level of deception. Uh, how much deception is optimal? How much is too much? Yeah. Um, is there, are there generalizations across the here's, here's what I have to say with that, because you're talking about in, in, the same scenario over and over right. again. We have studied largely one-shot deception, okay? So we, sustained deception is really hard, as any good adulterer would know. Uh, 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 and it's just hard to be able to do that over extended periods of time. So we have focused on, can I trick you into doing this? And that's okay. So I don't have an experimental answer for that. It's a really hard problem. Uh, I believe there are ways to be able to do that, uh, but I don't have any data uh, on that today. Um, fascinating topic, thank you very much. Sure. I, I, I have read uh, that uh, psych, psychological patients uh, going to therapy, uh, they've been studied as to whether their, you know, their relationship to an actual therapist or, or a simulated therapist. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think what I read was that people tended to be more comfortable with the simulated therapist mm -hmm because they came away not feeling judged, but if they were talking to an actual human being, yeah. they, would, they would feel judged. And this is another part of this complicated relationship between humans and robots. Yeah. It's, it's actually not just psychological patients. There's a lot of work going in the treatment of autism, uh, in particular with robots. Uh, it seems from the data uh, that there is evidence that uh, autistic children have a greater affinity for relating with robots which is trying to be shown to be transferable uh, to human beings uh, over time. So you can develop a relationship with a humanoid robot, which I don't know if it's because it's not judgmental or whatever the case may be, but it seems that it works better uh, with uh, having that as an intermediary uh, in this case. So it's being used as a therapeutic tool or being evaluated as a therapeutic tool by many researchers across the country. Brian uh, up at Yale is one, Maya Matarich at uh, USC, and all around the world. Uh, that's a big, big uh, research area is the use of uh, robots uh, for autism for very similar reasons. Wouldn't that case illustrate both sides of the problem, though? Because on the one hand, you want the, rob the therapeutic robot to be good enough to uh, give the impression that it understands and cares about the things that it, the person that it's interacting with. But you don't want it so good that they think that it's actually human because then they won't be as honest with it because they think that it's actually somebody who really cares about what they're saying. Yeah, I know. That's, that's one of the dangers that, again, getting back to that intimate robotic side of things as well, too. We can conceivably make these, you care about these agents more than you would your fellow humans as well too, uh, to the exclusion and isolation that may occur as a, as a consequence uh, of that. There's movies that show about that. There was a, uh, a, a I don't know, a, a, a cartoons and other things which I've shown in class that show that to the extreme. But we're, we are concerned about what is the right level and how can this be used to assist for those who may be suffering deficits. Uh, the bigger concern is for those who are normal with potentially addictive personalities and the like, could that lead to dysfunction uh, in society and more isolation uh, from other human beings if they get greater satisfaction from these far superior partners that we'll, we will be able to create, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
In your experiments, uh, I was just wondering how much of the robots' actions or deceptions were informed uh, by humans because uh, if after you pass a certain threshold, it, it might seem to reflect the human's intent to deceive rather than the robot's actual capacity. Okay, I, I, there were, these robots were autonomous, so I'm not sure uh, if I'm missing something here. Because uh, the robots uh, had embedded behaviors uh, within them, which were able to exhibit these things in the when and the how under these different types of circumstances. So there were no humans behind the curtain uh, uh, in these things. So uh, uh, there are studies that we have done, uh, Wizard of Oz studies, for example, which are exactly those sorts of things that are common in human-robot interaction. And we've done some in our laboratory as well. But these particular studies uh, were not uh, Wizard of Oz studies uh, in this case. So, um, following up on your wristwatch uh, example. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, not, it's not a Rolex, sorry. <laughs> no, not, not, not that one. The, um, it's always five minutes fast because that way oh, you that always get to, the, okay. get to the meeting on time. Right? There's, a, there's um, mm -hmm. a faculty member here who is um, working on the distinction between reliable and trustworthy. Mm -hmm. um, so, I can imagine be coming to rely on the watch, but knowing I could never trust it. Yeah. That's yeah, and so how does that, I mean, when you, when you think about these devices interacting with humans in some social context, is there a way to sort of parse apart that uh, set of I might not be appropriately qualified to be able to distinguish uh, uh, in this particular case. I'm understanding that. One of the areas perhaps I could better speak to is the notion of counter-deception, uh, which is important. And actually, this last NSF project will deal with that uh, as well, how we can prevent and recognize deception under different types of circumstances. So trustworthiness uh, um, and versus reliability. Um, one is at, at probably at a higher level. I suspect trustworth trustworthiness is cognitive and based upon the receiver of that particular information. And reliability is based on the inherent properties of the device. At least that's how I would think about it uh, uh, first off. But I am uh, neither a specialist in either of those uh, particular classic disciplines. But no, no thoughts on you know, where, what's the, where, should a, where should the robot be on that spectrum in, in a social context? Well, it depends on context, uh, it, it, not just social context, but in general context. I mean, here's the real question. Should you be able to opt in or opt out uh, in this case? And if you have chosen to opt in to allow your watch 90% of the time be correct, then you should trust it to do the right thing, right? Uh, but if you have said, I am not going to uh, allow you to be uh, deceptive to me, then uh, you should not, it should not be allowed to deceive you under those circumstances. I'm not sure I'm getting to the point in this, but those are the sorts of things I'm thinking about. So Ron, quick question. Mm -hmm. So if one of the uses, one of the applications of this is, for example, um, therapeutic robots, medical robots, uh, robots that provide uh, a degree of comfort in a palliative care uh, uh, context uh, or in a trauma context, like in your uh, Boston Marathon example. The, uh, our judgment of uh, deception and lying under those circumstances when it comes from human is whether the humans used good judgment mm -hmm. or not. Um, and that is something that can improve and something that can be learned. Um, and so to some extent, it seems like what the machine learning process needs to focus on is the process of making the judgment whether you should lie or not, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, at least on a sort of like we discussed earlier on an Aristotelian account has to do with the weighing of the specific circumstances, the weighing of results of this in the past and so on uh, and so forth. So it's, importantly, in other words, not a one-off mm -hmm. deception. Well, it's a one-off for that individual, right. but it's a repeatable over many individuals. Correct? Right, but for the judgment, as it were, to be good, yeah. the deceiver is not acting in a one-off framework, I guess is what I'm saying. The judgment is not a... It can use the same strategy over and over again, but in different works. circumstances, yeah. I should mention, though, uh, that uh, just as we used international humanitarian law in the military scenarios that we've uh, uh, spoken to in the past, 
In this case, we use occupational therapy uh, manuals because they instruct occupational therapists when to be completely truthful and when to intervene and when to do things that might not be completely honest under those cases. So we distill from the wisdom of the past of humans as opposed to necessarily try and uh, come up with it all on our own. So that's, that's the case. Just as you would train an occupational therapist to do things in certain ways, we try and use that wisdom to guide the robots so, similarly. I, I mean, I, I totally agree that there can be a wisdom of the humans. I probably disagree that it would come from the manual, because probably our best <laughs> occupational therapists haven't read it, but they have a great degree of experience yeah. and no, no right. Well, remember, in that work, we also talked about case-based reasoning. And case-based reasoning typically comes from expert judgment that has been in, in incorporated into a series of cases, which can be indexed and pulled up in a particular time and reused in a different set of circumstances. So uh, we've done that in a variety of different things, ranging from snipers to uh, medical doctors to a whole bunch of different things as well, too. So there's different ways to encode expert reasoning. So you can do it from experience, because case-based reasoning is learning from experience, uh, but you can also encode rules as well, too, that may be derived from uh, manuals that uh, people are supposed to read. <laughs> yeah, one of the other issues I've heard about in um, deep learning algorithms that uh, could, could get very sophisticated in terms of coming up with conclusions from large databases uh, and learning them as they go, um, in some cases that, uh, that whatever is going on inside the algorithm becomes so complex that the coder really can't tell what's going on, mm -hmm. so it loses its transparency. That's uh, correct. And I think it's a big issue in, in medical diagnostics. Mm -hmm. You want to know cause and effect. You don't want yeah. to just know association. So um, is there a possibility that as we get more complicated uh, robotics and algorithms, more complicated behaviors, um, and we always want to know what's going on in that uh, in the behavioral context for that that autonomous entity, but we may get to the point that, you know, we know they can learn how to deceive, we know they can uh, adopt goals of their own in the process, and we may get, may we get to the point where we're just not sure whether we can trust the robot or not. Well, yes, uh, especially with the notions of uh, non-transparent and non-explainable outcomes that you have typically with those uh, kinds of systems. The good news, if you need some reassurance uh, for the future, is uh, DARPA, for example, is having a major program in explainable artificial intelligence and uh, for better or for worse, uh, the president, without putting money there, has said AI is a priority uh, for use uh, uh, in our country, unlike the Chinese who said it's a priority and put billions of dollars uh, in the tank uh, to fuel that particular uh, research. But yes, uh, especially if you introduce uh, and strange things even happen with deep learning as well, too. I mean, they will occasionally just do things that just don't seem correct. Uh, and the features that they learn from large databases, this is what led to discrimination and bias in many algorithms as well, too, which was unexpected, still occurs. You need to be able to get explainability if you want to be able to relate uh, to humans. But I would contend also, we worked with radiologists much, many years ago in um, visual reasoning uh, in chest x-rays and things of that sort, how they come to analyze that. And what we discovered, and I think it's well known, is that the experts leap to a decision. Everything just jumps out at them, just kind of like in a, ch a master chess player. They look at the board, they understand what to do. So there is no deep reasoning associated with that. The novices if there is a novice doctor, you don't like to say you're being treated by a novice doctor. Uh, but if there is, they use more reasoning and explanation and going causality links and the like as well, too. So which is the right one? I mean, uh, the expert leaps to the conclusion and it might not be able to explain it exactly. Maybe post facto they could come up with some reasons, but they know what it is. Uh, is that good enough? Is that good enough for deep learning? Because deep learning can kind of do that. Uh, but we'd like some reassurance as well, too. It could make up some cockamamie explanation conceivably, which may or may not be true. Uh, that might be the deception as well, too. It may say, this is the reason why, just, but it may be right, even if it doesn't know that. And it gives you an explanation just to reassure you, so you will trust it. That's an interesting application of deception, uh, so that you will accept the therapy, which will save your life. Although I can't explain how I got it. <laughs> so I think we need to let go, because yeah. he's catching a plane back to Atlanta. So. Yeah. Thank you.
Most welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you.